a.m. And all was quiet in the Markham Grand at 6th and Morrison in downtown Portland. The building was empty, except for one person, 20-year-old Ava Aldrich, who was staying the night in the 10-story structure as a night telephone operator. She was fast asleep in a room on the fourth floor when she was suddenly awakened by the sound of a horrible crash. Quickly assuming something must have gone wrong, she went to a window and saw dust all around, like a bomb had just gone off. She quickly made a phone call to her superiors, who explained to her what had happened and that she should evacuate the building immediately. Instead of fleeing the scene, Ava made headlines for taking some time to dress up nice and fix up her hair so she could leave the building with class. And what exactly had happened? The three floors directly beneath her had completely collapsed, leaving only a thin floor separating Ava from a free fall. Whatever words you want to use for her, Ava was pretty fearless. The Markham Grand was one of the most charming buildings in all of downtown, with the glorious five-story Markham Grand Opera House adjoining it to the north. It opened in 1890, with the Markham Grand coming only a year later. The structure was built and named after Philip Augustus Markham, an early Portland settler arriving in town in 1851 at the age of 28. As a Portlander, he was twice elected a county judge and later became a member of the Oregon House of Representatives. By the start of the 1890s, he was thinking architecture. The land that the Markham Grand would ultimately grace was obtained by Markham from a William Chapman as compensation for a bill that Chapman owed him. Chapman had come to Portland even earlier than Markham, arriving in 1847 as a traveler along the Oregon Trail. When Markham obtained this land back in the 1850s, it was a simple, mostly tree-covered block. But by the 1880s, this area had become the epicenter of commerce in the city, highly coveted land. The building itself was expensive and had a distinct look to it. Completed in 1891, the building was highly regarded for being fireproof, being powered by electricity, not very common back then, and for being a, um, solid structure. Its connection to the beautiful 1600-seat Grand Theater next door only made the site more appealing, attracting the likes of Maurice Barrymore and Mark Twain. The Markham Grand also stood diagonal from the Pioneer Courthouse and directly across the street from the Portland Hotel. This building would prove to be another success in the life of Philip Markham, who would pass away at the age of 89 on May 8, 1912. Not long after this, control of the building changed hands and plans for renovation quickly began. By November, Renovation work was being done to the foundation of the building. This work was still going on on November 21st when, in the middle of the night, three floors to the eastern side of the building suddenly collapsed. Because work was being done on the building, people were quick to criticize these workers especially when it came out that the portion that had collapsed had yet to be renovated. On the face of it, this criticism hardly makes sense at all as it, more than anything, suggests the significance of that renovation work. 
the collapse was heard from several blocks away, leading to many people bundling up and venturing out to see what had happened. Fortunately, with it being the middle of the night, there was no one walking along 6th Avenue where the collapse happened. Multiple circumstances, aligning perfectly, helped keep anyone from dying that night, or even the following morning. The time, and even in the case of Ava Aldrich, who was one floor away from going down with the wreckage. To her added benefit, while her fourth floor room didn't go down in the 4 a.m. collapse, her portion of the floor did give way seven hours later at 11 a.m. But Ava was not the only person who should have been there that night. Joseph Tromwald, a medical student whose brother had an office in the building, frequently slept there. But for whatever reason, he ended up not sleeping there that night. In fact, the only known injury connected to the collapse as a whole happened in relation to that 11 a.m. collapse. When this occurred, there was a brief panic among onlookers, and some of them tried to run. In this, a little girl ended up being trampled, suffering a leg fracture. A worker on the scene had been on a ladder near the collapse site, taking down the sign for the theater directly next door. He paused his work, closed his ladder, and began walking north instead of south along 6th away from the collapse site. And only a moment later, the 11 a.m. collapse happened. This worker most certainly would have been at least injured, if not something much worse, had he chosen to walk in the opposite direction. Several buildings nearby had to be closed down for safety's sake, while the roads were also cleared of people and cluttered with debris for days after the collapse. Despite all of this, the attitude was that the building could be repaired and that renovations should go on. It was even theorized the building could be fixed up completely in less than two weeks, considering the fact that the area that did collapse was actually fairly small in the overall scheme of the building. The Markham Grand, it seemed, would be able to live on. Again, very early on, some pointed their finger at the renovation crew for unintentionally being responsible for the collapse. The fact that supports had been placed on the building near the collapse site, and those two had collapsed, added, at least on site, to this theory of renovation crew responsibility. But this perspective would change fast. E. B. McNaughton, the director of the current renovation project, and an architect himself, called out the quality of the brick used in building the Markham Grand. He would be quoted to say, some bricklayer's bum job 20 years ago is probably responsible. That and the very poor quality of the brick used in the building. It's easy to say that this guy was just looking for a scapegoat to take pressure off of his renovation work, but McNaughton was not the only one to question this brick. He also noted during their renovation work that the brick used was of poor quality and it just so happened that most of the brick used had been produced by Philip Markham's own brickyard. An investigation of the scene after the collapse did reveal that in the particular spot where the building gave way, some of the brick was soft. Because of this, over time, that brick crushed downward and eventually gave way. It's a tragedy in that nobody who investigated the aftermath believed such a collapse could have been foreseen, and yet, due to the quality of the brick used, the collapse was an inevitability, and it was the decision of the man whose name graced that building that made this an inevitability. 
the Markham Grand was originally slated to be a smaller building, and as its planned size grew, the costs understandably grew as well. Local brick manufacturers knew that this was a major project, and they knew that Philip Markham had money. They took advantage of this by raising their prices, leading Markham to make the decision to establish his own brickyard to produce bricks. Alas, on the cheap. Fortunately for him, he passed away before he had to see the aftermath of this decision. I don't mean to kick the man while he's down and been gone a very long time, but what if this collapse had happened at 4 p.m. instead of 4 a.m.? Who knows how many people could have died in the building and on the sidewalk outside. Several months ago, I paid a visit to Portland's Riverview Cemetery, the final resting place for many prominent early Portlanders. This is where Philip Markham was buried, and even when visiting his gravesite, I just couldn't help but be mildly critical in the moment. This is the burial site of Philip Markham, who's a fairly prominent, well-to-do early Portlander. And one of the things, tragically, he's most known for, here's his grave. He actually died shortly before these events happened because it was November 1912, but he built the Markham Grand, which stood right across the street from, right across Morrison from where Pioneer Courthouse Square is today. And because it wasn't built, Philip kind of, yeah, you know, cut some corners building the place. A chunk of the building collapsed, and fortunately it was the middle of the night and there was only one person there. It was a woman who literally lived on the floor right above where the collapsing stopped. So she managed to get out alive, and they ended up tearing the whole building down. Uh, just unfortunately, didn't, didn't, uh... Didn't quite uh, do the, the follow the rules he probably should have been following, but that's what. He, he, regardless, he's still a fairly prominent earlier Portlander. A construction engineer, J. M. Dugan, also independently examined the aftermath of the collapse and reached the conclusion that soft brick settled down and finally gave way. Another example of the great potential for tragedy that comes when people cut corners. What makes things worse is, while they were just claims that cannot at this late date be verified, there were claims that several years before the building's collapse, it had been examined and deemed unsafe. But nothing was done. The primary department used by the city for building inspections was established not long before the Markham Grand's collapse, suggesting nothing was done in the past because such a department did not yet exist. With the realization as to what caused the collapse, it only took three days after plans were expressed to fix up the Markham for everyone's attitude to change. These soft bricks were probably scattered all throughout the building, making another future collapse extremely likely. The conclusion was reached at a stockholders meeting of the Northwest Fidelity Company, the present owners of the Markham Grand, to demolish the building. And they wanted this done quick so they could put up a new building. I mean, at least they already had a nearly completed renovation of the foundation to their credit. Less than 24 hours after this decision was made, construction workers were on the scene to get things started. It was also noted that the company wanted to construct their new building in a hurried manner so they could move in as quickly as possible. Rushed construction of a new building on the very site where a building, shoddily constructed, 
had a collapse occur. Well, at least their new building was planned to be made of steel-reinforced concrete, as opposed to brick, which was more in vogue in the 1890s. But even that didn't work out perfectly. Strangely enough, the construction of the building that replaced the Markham Grand, the American Bank Building, which still stands there today, had about as much controversy as the Markham Grand collapse itself. Like the Markham Grand, the plans for the new building kept getting larger and larger. Originally planned to be a 12-story structure, it became a 13-story structure made of steel and white pressed brick. When all was said and done, the building ended up being 15 stories tall, which actually caused a great deal of controversy as a building this tall was considered to be in violation of city codes. But ultimately, whatever the case, it went through, with the bank building finishing construction in 1913. Up until 1927, it would be the tallest building in Portland. And also, fortunately, the beautiful theater next door to the Markham Grand, later renamed as the Orpheum, would avoid being demolished and remain standing until 1976. But Philip Markham's 1891 creation? It serves to us as another reminder of the perils of not doing things right, and that while sometimes tragedies don't take human lives, decisions made by people in power can have grave consequences.